the planet sparse structure. This is a joint work with my advisor, Guy Bresler, who's sitting right there, and Wasim Hulehel, who's a postdoc in the RLE at MIT. So um, first, I'll just briefly motivate the problems that we'll be looking at. So in unsupervised learning, it's become common to assume that there's some latent um, structural assumption on some underlying signal in the problem of interest, such as sparsity or low rank. And the reason for this is that often in high dimensional unsupervised learning problems, you have some bad dependence on the dimension in the sample complexity or minimal SNR necessary to solve the task. Um, so it's favorable to make one of these structural assumptions in order to alleviate this dependence. Just as an example, consider John Stone's model of spiked, uh, the spike covariance model of sparse PCA, in which we observe n examples from uh, sparsely spiked d dimensional Gaussian. In this case, the minimal SNR necessary to detect such a spike only depends logarithmically on the dimension, and this is because of the sparsity assumption. So while these, these structural assumptions are popular, they lead to several complications. So first, they often lead to problems that are NP-hard in the worst case. So in the example I gave, the natural worst case formulation would be a top k-sparse eigenvector computation, which is NP-hard to approximate. And as a result, because of these NP-hard resulting worst case formulations, it's, at, it's natural to take on average case formulations in unsupervised learning. However, if you take on an average case um, formulation, this often leads to statistical computational gaps, which are cases in which the minimal SNR necessary to solve the task is much lower than the minimal SNR uh, required by the best known polynomial time algorithms. So in the example I gave, um, a cold paper in 2013 uh, by Berthe and Rigolet gives evidence for a k to k squared gap in the minimal theta necessary to solve the problem. So the goal in our paper is to understand the relationship between the statistical computational gaps across several different problems, and also to provide evidence for the gaps and give tight lower bounds. So um, the first thing to answer is what is the right notion of an average case reduction? So the types of problems we'll be considering are detection and recovery problems. In detection problems, you get, you're given an observation X, and the task is to distinguish between two hypotheses. First, that either it's sampled from some pure noise model, or that it comes from a model with some planted sparse structure, which is typically drawn uniformly at random from some natural set. And then we'll also consider recovery problems, which is to recover the support of the planted sparse structure given an observation from the corresponding model. But for the purposes of this talk, I'm not going to consider recovery. So the notion of reduction in average case that we'll consider is reduction in total variation, which was introduced by Berthe and Rigolet in 2013 and also by Ma and Wu in 2014. And under this paradigm, we say a reduction maps problem one to problem two if it maps the corresponding distributions for each of the two hypotheses to their corresponding target distribution. So the H0 distribution goes to the H0 distribution of problem two, same for H1, and R runs in polynomial time. And sorry, so when I say map, I mean map approximately under total variation, so that's what this line at the bottom is. So why is this the natural notion of an average case reduction? Well, the reason is if you have an algorithm which achieves a type one plus type two error of epsilon on problem two, then composing this with R gives uh, an algorithm A composed with R which achieves an asymptotic type one plus type two error of epsilon on problem one. And also, if A runs in polynomial time, then so does A composed with R. So this notion of average case reduction ends up ha having some technical challenges that aren't present in worst case reductions. Um, so in worst case reductions, you generally take a general instance of a first problem to a very structured instance of a second problem. So for example, in a canonical reduction from three sat to say independent set, we take a three sat formula and we construct a graph with seven vertices per clause, one of which cor each of which corresponds to each the seven possible satisfying assignments for the three variables in each clause. And we connect two vertices if they correspond to a consistent ass inconsistent assignment. Now some large independent set corresponds to some assignment satisfying all the clauses. Now, in this case, if you think about the space of all three sat formulas, we're mapping that to a very small image within the set of graphs, just these ones with these particular structure. Now, for average case reductions, the situation is very different. Not only do we have to take general instances to general instances, 
we also need to map very precisely a noise distribution for the first problem to a specific noise distribution for the second. Also, there's this um, very subtle issue of parameterization. The problems here are parameterized, whereas in the very simple instance I gave in worst case reductions, it is not. So when you have some sort of parameter corresponding to the SNR, in order to show tight lower bounds for a second problem, you would need to uh, map the SNR in such a way that you preserve the computational boundary. So if you have, say, a problem like Plantic Clique, which has a computational boundary, a conjectured computational boundary at k equals the square root of n, and say a uh, problem such as sparse PCA, which has a conjecture computational boundary at theta equals square root of k squared over n, you would want to map an instance of Plantic Clique with that parameters pack kn to a parameter pack like theta kn with that exact correspondence of theta equals square root of k squared over n. Like, in other words, mapping the boundaries faithfully. So following um, a recent line of work in average case reductions, we s our starting point for the web of average case reductions that we're going to try uh, to build here is planted clique. So the goal here is to build a web of average case reductions um, in order to relate statistical computational gaps across different problems. And the starting point is planted clique, which is to distinguish between two hypotheses. First, that G is drawn from an erdos renyi random graph, or second, that it's drawn from an erdos renyi random graph with a, a k clique planted uniformly at random. And a long line of algorithmic work um, all stops at the barrier of k equals square root n, so there's this long-standing conjecture that there's no polynomial time algorithm to solve planted clique if k is much smaller than square root n. Um, so here's an incomplete list of some previous PC uh, planted clique reductions to statistical problems. Um, one, as you can sort of see noted on the side, um, a lot of these problems, um, a lot of these reductions are reductions to variants of average case problems in which there's some sort of uh, robustness assumed on the algorithm. Like it shows lower bounds maybe for algorithms which are robust to all, like this which should solve the problem for all sub-Gaussian noise distributions, or actually don't need to know pr particular parameter settings of k, like the sparsity or the SNR. And if you think about trying to construct a web of average case reductions, this ends up being a little problematic, because if you're trying to compose two reductions, say R1 and R2, um, you would need, and suppose that each of R1 and R2 start from some natural noise distribution, like erdos renyi or exactly the spike covariance model for sparse PCA, then you would need the first reduction, R1, to map exactly to the, the input distribution to R2 in order to compose those reductions and end up with a single reduction to the, to the last problem. And um, so our main contribution is to introduce a set of techniques which yield new lower bounds um, for average case problems and also strong enough lower bounds that you can compose them in exactly this way and yield a web of reductions. So I'll just briefly outline what these techniques are. So we, come up with, we came up with ad hoc names for them, but um, the first is rejection kernels, which provides uh, a computational way of performing a change of measure. Um, and this builds on um, a technique by Man Wu. And then we introduce something called distributional lifting, which is um, a variant of a graph lift that, that preserves statistical independence between edge indicators in a graph. And it also uses a natural intermediate of some sort of matrix which has um, distributions other than Bernoulli edge indicators. So maybe Poisson, Poisson samples or Gaussian samples, and that turns out to be necessary to achieve exactly the type of trade-off we want. And then reflection cloning, which is just a sharper ver version of distributional lifting, which breaks um, a symmetry in like the distribution. Uh, and then a method called random rotations, which maps exactly the spike covariance model. And so the result is um, a web of average case reductions, which um, shows several new results, including lower bounds for planet independence set. We recover a more general regime of planet dense subgraph. Uh, we give sharp lower bounds for sparse, spi sparse spiked Wigner. Uh, we introduce a few models. Um, and one remark I'll make on this is that we don't know currently of any reductions which go directly from the root to some of the, the leaf nodes. So it su kind of indicates that um, using natural problems as, as intermediates and average case complexity can be, um, can be useful like it is in worst case complexity. Okay. Thanks. Questions? <laughs>
people are tired. Yeah, questions? All right. Let's thank the speaker again. And, uh, let's